Welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. Uh, my name is Michael Penn. I'm the vice president for about another 24 hours. Uh, so uh, please, uh, I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, it's not often that you have the pleasure to, to sit next to somebody who has done something that no other human being on the planet has done. And we have such a person with us here today. She has, she dove freestyle underneath ice for a longer distance than any person, man or woman, has ever done. So this is a world record holder uh, sitting here next to me. And uh, in addition to that, uh, she's with us here in Japan, and she's been involved in uh, diving uh, near the site of the, uh, the frigate Ertuğrul, uh, Ertuğrul Firkatein in Turkish, which was a ship which came here in 1890. Uh, it's not a very well-remembered incident outside of Japan-Turkey relations, but uh, it was nonetheless a very interesting bit of Meiji period history. And she dove at the site where this ship crashed, and uh, she's going to tell us about that as well. As I understand it, there will be two main themes in her initial presentation. First of all, she'll be talking about her uh, dive uh, in the site of the Ertuğrul, which is in Wakayama Prefecture. And then she will talk a little bit about her activities in regard to protecting the environment, which is a, a strong interest of hers. So uh, I will hand it over to her. We'll have our initial talk, and then we'll open up to Q&A as usual. And I should mention, uh, we'll also have an, uh, one or two uh, short videos of just a, a few minutes each. Okay, well that's the first video, and now we're going to open up uh, this section of her talk. Uh, of course, this is Shahika Erjumen. Please. Um, hello everybody, and thanks to inviting me, having me here, to Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan, and Mr. Errol Emet, he contacted me to invite me here. So, um, 
It was really very special dive for me. It was not very deep and hard dive because it was in 50, around 15 meters. But this area uh, where Ertuğrul sank uh, 125 years ago, it's a very strange area because there is always current, there is always waves, and you don't know what's going to happen in the weather. So the first day uh, we arrived to Kushimoto at 3 o'clock. And 4 a.m. we were supposed to meet with the crew to go to the boat. And then we made our dive around 6 o'clock in the morning after the preparation. Um, and between our dives, suddenly the weather changed. And then uh, we were looking to the sea and uh, start to understand more and more what they had uh, 125 years ago. Because the waves were really strong. And underwater, it's really not easy to fight with the current. So there is more than 500 people died there. And uh, after the dive, we realized much more what happened there. We didn't see like a whole shipwreck there because there are s just some pieces. Uh, this is because of sea conditions and the weather conditions. But still, um, there are some research there, especially Mr. Tufan Turanma is keeping the underwater research about Arthur's shipwreck. And uh, we are really very happy and honored to become a small part of these events because uh, there was very big events in Arthur uh, in Kushimoto about Arthur's shipwreck this year. Especially, uh, I would love to thank you to, thanks to uh, Turkish Naval Forces and uh, Turkish Tokyo Embassy uh, and the Turkish Ambassador to Japan, Mr. Ahmet Bülent Meriç, because they organized a very special and very big event. Our Turkish uh, Mehter Band were making some Ottoman music there with Japanese na uh, Naval uh, Army Band. So for us, it was really, really very special event. And also, for me, on the streets, I was seeing everywhere Turkish and Japanese flags. And uh, you feel like at home, and you see the friendship. Uh, since long time, Japanese are really always friendly. Even I had some Japanese letter pen friends uh, since I was seven years old. So still, we are in contact. and. Uh, I can see more like how friendly Japanese people are. So this was very essential dive for me. It was not like a record dive or not very hard dive, but the conditions and the importance of the dive was really too much for me. Okay, and I believe we're now moving on to the second video. Yeah, like um, about if I would love to say something else. This dive um, also was very important for Japanese people, Japanese government, Kushimoto government, and also uh, the princess of Japan, Miss Akiko of Mikasa was there. And we honored to meet with her, to see her around. And you understand more and more how not only Turkish people, also Japanese people take care about it. And now our pe people, our mar martyrs, are at home there. We know this, and we are very happy about it. So this is how I start the underwater sports, actually. So, but my mom, in this video, you will watch my mom, because uh, I had asthma in my childhood. And after that, I start free diving. So she knows much better than me how I started and how, how was it in the beginning. So you will see my mom mostly in this video. Bayağı uzak. Hatta eşim 
arkadaşıyla konuşuyordu. Geçen adasına yüzlerim falan diye onu duymuş. Bir bak gelir simitini almış. Nereye gidiyorsun dediğimizde hiç korkmadan Keçi adasına gidiyorum, Keçi adasına gidiyorum. Simitini aldım derinde. Yani o derece sütten sudan da korkmuyordu, derisi çok seviyordu. 7 yaşına kadar devamlı işte ilaçlarla yaşadı. Ondan sonra doktorlar bu böyle olmaz dediler ve İstanbul'a bizi gönderdiler. Orada profesörlere gittik, testler yapıldı ve alerjik astmatik yani bronşiyel astma çıktı. Çok şükür 12 yaşında aşılar bitti, ilk okul bitirdi. O yaz Çanakkale Su Altı Kulübü'ne gitmek istedi yaz tatilinde. Birkaç gün gitti. Kızım nedir ücreti dediğinde hoca çok beğendi. Ben bahane benim takımı alacak hemen dedi ve hiç kursa gitmeden direkt takımıma girdi. Çanakkale Su Altı Kulübü'ne ve o gün bugündür. Demek ki su üstü alerji yapıyor ama su altı gerçek onun mutlu olduğu hayatına yani canına can kadar demek ki su altıymış. Ben bir balık burcuyum. Herhalde kızım da bir balık oldu. Okay. So. You want to say something? <laughs> well, um, I believe, uh, you know, you, you, if you could just introduce briefly your uh, activities for the environment, uh, yeah. then we'll move on to the Q&A. Okay, um, just I have some sentence about this video because uh, in my childhood, even I couldn't go out from home. I was at home all the day and sport was like a dream. Even playing with my friends were, is, were like a dream. So uh, after I start free diving, after I start water sports, my life changed hundred uh, percent. And that's why I'm more sensitive about the environment projects. Because free diving is not just a sport, it's a, like, adaptation to the nature so you are always in the nature and uh, when you spend more time in the nature you understand more and more what's happening around so uh, my all uh, feelings and thanks are to the water to change my life and that's why I'm always into some environment projects one of them is uh, protecting the water since three four years we are making some videos documentaries speech and we are traveling traveling all over the world to promote this uh, project so this was the beginning and after that uh, we start to do some projects about to protect the uh, under dangerous species uh, marine species so we made uh, some sea turtles project and the specific kind of uh, sea turtle is Caretta Caretta, which is under danger. Uh, so we start to make also some projects with them, with Ecological Research uh, Foundation in Turkey. And uh, also we are organizing dives with handicapped people, with disabled people in Turkey. So we organize some camps. It's not just one day activity. We, s we try to teach them how to dive uh, with some professional instructors. And I am free diving instructor by, uh, at the same time. So uh, we take care about them and we teach them. And after a one week course, they learn how to dive and then they have the certification and they start to dive all over the world whenever they want. So uh, we really, uh, we are really too much interested about these projects. 
Okay, and with that, we are now uh, opening it up to the floor for your questions. Uh, is this the microphone over here? Okay, so uh, if I call on you, uh, please uh, come over to the microphone and give your affiliation and name, and then uh, ask your question. So I'm looking for hands. Yes, Jonathan. Hi, thanks. Um, my name is Jonathan Sobel. I work for the New York Times. Um, I, I've been fascinated by free diving ever since I read a profile of uh, Sarah Campbell, I think yeah. her name is, about yes. five years ago in the in the New Yorker, and and uh, so this uh, is maybe not directly related to today's theme, but I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about free your diving. training, about how th that I think I read that piece about five years ago, and I'm mm -hmm. just wondering if you could also tell us how the sport is evolving. Um, you know, the, the, the new, new goals, new challenges, new types of training, what, uh, just t tell us a little bit sure. about the sport itself and what you do. Sure. Uh, Sarah Campbell is a really good friend and I'm always impressed about her. She's a great diver. Uh, and also here today, there is Mrs. Zhu. Uh, we didn't met yet, but I'm always also impressed about her. She's a Japanese record holder. She's uh, impressive diver also. So I'm really happy to be in a community like that. And free diving is really more than a sport. And when you start to dive, you have too much physiologic change. Uh, when you start to hold your breath, some uh, diving reflexes started, starts. And you can see these reflexes in mammalians like dolphins, whales, seals. So you b became a part of the sea after you start to dive. And when you start to dive, with the pressure, your lungs are getting smaller and smaller. Let's say if your lungs look like a football, football ball, then it becomes like a tennis ball in the 90 or 100 meter. So this is very physiologic and healthy change. Uh, this is just to resist to the pressure. And when you go up, it becomes normal. And your blood pressure slows down, your heart rate slows down, and you are like in a dream, and you became a part of the sea then. And in free diving, you can train in the sea, in the pool. You need to hold your breath. Free diving is like, uh, you just improve your breath hold time. You can dive deep or you can swim long or you can just hold your breath longer and longer. Uh, and last time, I'm actually from Turkey. We have just CMAS uh, Federation. This is the official underwater sports federation. And my country recognized this underwater uh, federation. So um, we try some record attempts, and my last dive was 91 meter uh, in variable weight with no fin. So this is a different discipline. Only CMAS has this discipline. But this year, uh, I want to break some new national records, and I just started to train for them. And hopefully I can go deeper, but my aim is not only break record or go deep because I, I just uh, find my true life after I started this sport. So I want to keep going on these environment projects. Also, we are doing some documentaries in Turkey. Uh, we have some videos also we can show you a little bit later. And I'm impressed about Japanese traditional AMA divers because this is kind of the starting of free diving. Japanese women divers are diving for um, collecting pearls or seaweeds since 2000 years in your tradition. And uh, this is very impressive and they are so rare now. Uh, so we would love to make some documentary and projects with them. And I will start to search how can we do it when I go back to my hometown, my Turkey, and uh, hopefully we can do some documentaries about them. Have you met any of them? No, not yet. I would love to. And this is first time in Japan for me, so the next time we'll be with them probably. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> next question. 
while we're waiting, I would like to ask a little bit more on related to his question. So you personally, how do you train when you're, when you were, for example, going for a world record or when you were going for mm. the world record? You know, how did you, how did you go about training? What was your method? Mm -hmm. Um, people think like this is a dangerous sport, but it is not if you have all the safety issues. So more than training, it is a mental sport actually. Uh, your brain is so clever and you are always fighting with your brain because breath hold is not very natural. We are automatically breathing in and out uh, during the day more than 80,000 times. and. Uh, for this to try a record you need to fight with your brain and actually not fight I would say convince your brain so you just t tell you are fine you, you are gonna be okay and you just discover your limits you just push your limits and we see like human beings can hold the breath more than 10 minutes now so this is <laughs> something really really impressive for human being and we just discover ourselves so i'm not training too hard like a triathlete of course i'm swimming i'm diving i'm holding my breath i'm doing yoga stretching many things uh, but the main part is just the concentration and focusing for a record or for some trainings yeah yes Hello, my name is Louis Krauss. Um, I'm a free writer. I'm, fr I'm from the Baltimore group. I'm here writing for the J uh, Japan Subculture Research Center. Uh, thanks for nice your talk. Um, I was just wondering, um, is there like a is there a big tradition on, in terms of free diving? Like, is are there any specific places or traditions that you base like how diving is like formed? I've read like books like The Pearl about like people diving for pearls and stuff like that, and just free divers. Um, is this like a tradition that's dying away at all, or is it something that's still very popular in today's world? Would you say the sport? Um, did I understand correctly? Like, um, there are not too much mm -hmm. divers still. Mm -hmm. for the pearl or for collecting things mm -hmm. because actually underwater is getting poor and poor mm -hmm. in turkey we don't have uh, too much fish now for example mm -hmm. or we don't have any um pearl uh, mussels or yeah. something uh, seashells right. so uh, there is not too much people now, but uh, we just know the tradition and there are very like rare mm -hmm. ama divers yeah. as i know in japan mm -hmm. and in turkey we have sponge divers mm -hmm. but just a few oh, and see. it's really uh, we are trying to talk with them we talk with them and they have great stories mm -hmm. and yeah it's just honor to meet with them but yeah. they are not doing it still Very nice. yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. What kind of well, I want you to go ahead and use the microphone. <laughs> what kind of people make good free divers? You know, you have to certain mental state, certain physical attributes, like you, know, you have like blood pressure. I mean, what is if there's a common thing in successful free divers? What is it? You mean the key point of success or something? Yeah, what kind of people, physically or mentally? Mm -hmm. you, you, you don't you ask of, me. <laughs> if you think of the free divers you know who are successful. I mean, I had asthma, don't ask me. And <laughs> actually, like in my blood test, I have very low of hemoglobin, which is very important for athletes. Like this is to carry oxygen in the, in the system, in the blood. So I don't believe there, there is specific rules. Like if you met with Sarah Campbell, she's um, not doing any other sports. She's just diving and she's quite small as you see her. So there is, mm, this is just mental sport as I believe. And uh, probably you need to have a good adaptation to the water. First, you have to be really comfortable in the water. So you need to love the water and then you need to flexible because there's too much pressure change in your body. For example, when I dive nine, around 90 meters, I have uh, 10 kilogram in my east centimeter uh, square in my body. So this is 
too much pressure. So you need to be really flexible. And this is the main thing. And then, of course, you need to be in a good shape and have a good breath hold. And mentally, if you are strong, if you believe in yourself, then you go. Yeah. In your world record dive, I understand you dove under ice. Yes. Uh, that sounds kind of cold to me. Uh, and it also sounds a little scary to me. <laughs> so how, how on earth did you manage to, or convince yourself to dive under ice in freezing water? Um, I don't like cold, actually, really. And like, I don't know how I decided this, because it was my first record attempt, and um, I was living in Turkey and never dived under ice. And my friend was diving under the ice and he said, you can do it. And I said, yes, I can do it. And I decided to go to Austria for trainings. And the first training was awful. Like I didn't like the idea to being under the ice because the ice is so thick. It is like 30, 40 centimeter. So the car can't the car can uh, drive on, uh, on you and you are just under it and people are walking on the ice so you can see the shadows when you are diving and <laughs> it's a little bit claustrophobic but <laughs> yeah and we announced the record attempt so there was no way out and i start trainings and the aim was to pass 100 meters because that was the main record that time. And if I pass 100 meter, mm -hmm. then I would be in the Guinness World Record books. So this was something exciting for me. And I just start training that time. But uh, just before the record attempt, one, 10 days ago, 10 days ago, one German man diver came and he broke the 100 meter record with 108 meter. So I was really shocked because under the ice, one meter is very important. You have uh, wetsuits, you have gloves, you have like socks in your foot. So it's not very comfortable being under ice. Even if you can do in the pool around 200 meter, you can do maybe half of it under the ice. The conditions are really different. So uh, my hope was not <laughs> in a good level and uh, I was thinking, and then my team was really very good, and I said, okay, just try, you can do it. And I did 110 meters in the record attempt dive. So this was the biggest challenge, I think, in my life. And after that, now I do it easily, yeah. Well, just to follow up, how long did it take you to go 110 meters underwater? And how did you navigate? How did you know where the opening was on the yeah. other side? Yeah. Uh, under the ice, it's impossible to find your way. So that's why it's very dangerous. And we have a safety and yeah, guide rope. So you just follow it. And there is only one more enter, um, exit. So you enter, you swim, and then you exit from the other hole. There is no way out from in the middle. Just there are some safety holes for scuba divers because we have some scuba divers under the ice to show for just in case of emergency. And um, it took like two and a half minutes under the ice. So it was not easy to see the exit even. And they put some red flags and they show me the exit. So I find my way and yeah, I came out. <laughs> Sorry, I have to answer another question. So what are the options? You either break the world record or, or you, you're still there, frozen? <laughs> <laughs> what happens if, you know, in 95 years, yeah. you, you, you, you can't do it anymore? How do, you, how do they save you? Yeah, like saving issue is a safety diver is coming to you with scuba gear, with air tank, and give you the air and bring you out from one hole. But there was no option for me because it was my first record. I found some sponsors that time and we announced it. So there was no turn back for me. It, there was just one exit for me. But just the fact that that's going to be yeah, a yeah. slightly less scary than Yeah. So yeah. were the scuba divers next to you while you were diving? Um, like 10 meters far away, but they still can see me. And yeah, they follow me. 
uh, but they were a little bit far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any nice places to dive in Japan that you would like to go to? Uh, I'm coming uh, from Okinawa oh. now, so the dive was really good there, but I just spent a few days, I, uh, so I would love to discover more Japan because I heard very good things about uh, here. So next time, also I would love to dive with whales and some sea uh, mammalians here. We don't have them in Turkey too much, so we never met with them. But in Japan, my friends told me like when they are diving, they can hear the sound of the whale. So probably, I, I hope to meet with them next time. Uh, yeah. As for the questioners, there is a reason we have you go to the mics, and that's because it's being recorded. So, for example, his question can't be heard. So it's not just the room that we're playing to. <laughs> All right, uh, next question. Okay, well, while you're waiting, I have many questions for, so I'm just going to take my opportunity. Uh, so how did you get interested in the air to rule? What, what in the Japan, you know, this story, what is it that uh, grabbed you about it? Um, my hometown is Çanakkale, maybe you know about it. It's Kalipoli also. So it is very important point in the First World War. And we have the most number of shipwrecks in my hometown. So uh, when I go there and dive in these shipwrecks, I feel very different because there is too much history, there is too much story about them. Like you can have more than 100 movies like Titanic, like Titanic in my hometown. There is always something, but all of them are like uh, war shipwrecks. So Ertrul was a peace shipwreck. It was coming for peace and bringing some gifts uh, to Japan. So this was very important also. And uh, I was having some ideas how it's going to be. And I was reading some stories. And we were in contact with Tufan Turan. And uh, our cameraman is also underwater director. And he has many uh, rights, many, uh, I don't know. Uh, some rights about shipwrecks. So he explained me how important is it. And since a few years, we were thinking to come here. But suddenly, the uh, Turkish Tokyo Embassy, we had contact with them. And uh, they told us that there's a big event here. So in the last, sec last moment, we just uh, contact with them and arrived here. And uh, we, yeah, yeah, just came. <laughs> And how long is your visit for? And, and uh, so uh, you went to Okinawa already, and you went to obviously yeah. Kushimoto and Wakayama Prefecture yeah. already. So how long was the visit, and when are you leaving? Yeah. Like I told you, like since my childhood, I'm always in love with Japan. So I took the opportunity to visit some temples in Kyoto. And I'm really impressed a lot because you feel so... I don't know, <laughs> so relax, so calm when you visit these things. And for me, it is personal thing to be in Japan. Uh, so uh, I, I, I visit Kyoto, Osaka, Okinawa, and today Tokyo, and tomorrow we are leaving. Yeah. OK, I'm looking for more questions. Uh, yes. This is a somewhat strange question, but um, in Japan, I know there's like a lot of exotic sea life that people are eating. Does that weird you out at all that they're eating such weird fish and things like that? Mm -hmm. Like um, this is ecosystem actually. <laughs> so things are eating things, and um, I eat fish. I eat my friends, <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm not too much like I don't like hunting or I don't like these things, but. They eat also plankton, some of them, or they eat some small fish, so this is the system. And uh, I'm really trying to be careful most um, to save their playground, to save the environment. Then, for example, uh, if we keep the, to pollute the water, then they will not survive. So just if you eat one fish, it's, I think, not very big. Uh, danger, but if you if we uh, cannot save their area, then for all of them it starts to be more dangerous. 
So I'm more aware of these things. And I'm nutrition specialist, that's <laughs> why maybe if I'm just free diver, I, I would say something else, but uh, I studied in the university about nutrition and diet, so like it, there's a protein and uh, very good omega-3 acids, and so people need these things from the outside, actually. There is one more video, so we can close with this video, maybe. Um, all right, well, uh, we will have another video, but before the video, I do have one more question okay. before the video. Okay. Uh, on the seafloor uh, at Kushimoto, what did you find there? Mm -hmm. what, what, what does exist down along the floor at this point? Mm -hmm. uh, just about art rule, just some pieces. So um, you cannot see a whole ship there. But um, it is a rocky place. So there are the rocks, seaweeds, and between the seaweeds, just there are small caves also uh, between the rocks. And uh, there are just small pieces of arterial between these things. Um, so uh, yeah, it's more like rocky, mm -hmm. rocky underwater. Metal or wood? Uh, the pieces you're from the ship was a wooden ship, so are you finding <coughs> metal pieces that exist down there? Uh, yeah, like, um, I don't know English name, it's a big uh, bomb. Cannons? Cannons? Guns? Maybe. Yeah. Not gun, but like uh, metal, like small torpedo, oh. like the small things. And also mm -hmm. some small um, uh, cushion, ne demek? English, <laughs> Huh? Probably, yeah, okay. yeah, some, some of them, they showed us, yeah, not too much things. So there is a video about our uh, underwater shooting in Turkey. So this is the marine life in Turkey. Ertuğrul, Kushimoto area looks like this actually, like there are caves. This year also uh, we will try a new Turkish record and hopefully we can do some SIMAS world records this year. But with every record we try to give some message because this is the m most important way to talk with people. So every time we try to protect some, some under dangerous species and it was like sea turtles before, sea mullets, uh, so this time also we will protect the sea mammalians, but at the same time we want to make some uh, charity, some donation for the uh, 
kids for uh, for the um, like wom women's and kids. So we want to find a way to start them to swimming and uh, to find the enough budget to start to make them start in sport this year. So we are trying to find um, 400 uh, 100 women and 100 kids for donate them. And this year is also in my hometown in Kalipoli, 100 year, years of the First World War, uh, the Kalipoli and Çanakkale uh, World War. So uh, probably we will try to pass 100 meters, uh, again, in memory of this uh, in my hometown. More questions? Uh, lots of people here have been silent. <laughs> Okay. Um, I was just kind of curious in the video, we didn't really see the ship uh, that much, the ship that you, you dove at in Japan. Uh, I was just wondering what kind of ship was that and what did it really look like? Um, mm -hmm. yeah. um, I mean, it is like wooden, mm -hmm. uh, like sailing probably, but how can I explain? <laughs> yeah. Um, how can I explain it? Is it like a big ship with like passengers? Yeah, and stuff like there it? was more than 500 people. Mm -hmm. It's like 600 people and more than one year they were like there, okay. living there. Gotcha. And what else? You with the air to rule, the yeah, ship? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, well, she, she's not a historian of, of the issue, uh, but uh, the uh, ship was sent uh, from Ottoman Turkey in 1889 took yeah. about nine months to get to Japan, mm. spent the summer of 1890 here, mm. uh, and it was a warship. It was a ship of the Ottoman Navy, mm. but an old one. Cool. Yeah, and it, it sank yeah, uh, in, on September 16, 1890. Yeah. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Okay, uh, well, uh, so uh, it seems that we have exhausted the questions, but if you want to keep in touch, uh, please, if you'll leave uh, your business card, uh, her, her or her press agents will get in touch with you to make a contact. And uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, and let's give a warm uh, welcome as I give a one-year honorary membership to Ms. Shahika Erjimen. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're a member. Wow, okay. <laughs> I didn't know.